Yes. If this is the height of the barrier v naught and this is v of x versus x, there is a finite probability that the particle is found in this classically forbidden region even if its total energy is E. If this is the total energy of the particle, a classical particle shot on this potential is going to come down here. It is at best going to be able to reach this point. It cannot climb up this potential barrier beyond this point and then it goes back and the reason is its kinetic energy cannot be negative. If this is the total energy and that is the potential energy this would imply the kinetic energy is negative which is not possible. Now the question asked is now quantum mechanically also the kinetic energy's expectation value can never be negative. We saw that because the expectation value of p squared or p squared in one dimension in any state of the system is essentially psi p p psi and of course this is the norm uh, square of the norm of the vector p psi and therefore that cannot be negative either. But the question is if you shoot a particle of energy E less than v naught but greater than 0 greater than this asymptotic value on this side certainly there is a finite probability that the particle is in this region and there is a transmission probability to this side. The question is when the particle is in this region does it imply that the kinetic energy is negative. So this idea does not exist in quantum mechanics you cannot speak of saying you cannot speak uh, there is no concept as what is the momentum of the particle when it is here at this location. And therefore there is no question of saying when it is in this region what is the kinetic energy because the kinetic energy the, the total energy eigenstate a total energy eigenstate is not an eigenstate of the kinetic energy or the potential energy separately. It is completely a property of the state as a whole and that is this state has a wave function which is spread out from minus infinity to infinity everywhere. <coughs> so this is important to recognize that you cannot speak in quantum mechanics of what the value of the potential energy is when the particle is in a given region or in at a given point similarly for the kinetic energy okay. Now what is the other question? The operators x and p have continuous spectra in classical physics we know that minus infinity less than less than x less than plus infinity and similarly for p. When you convert these two operators then in quantum mechanics automatically all the possible eigenvalues which were there classically or also eigen, all the possible values which existed classically are eigenvalues quantum mechanically and the spectrum is continuous. Of course if you put in boundary conditions and so on then the operator might have a discrete spectrum. This is what happens for instance if you put the thing in a box and then say that the wave function must vanish at the ends of the box then as you know just like waves on a string the eigenvalues could get quantized for example the eigenvalues of the energy get quantized if you are in a potential well or if you are in a confining potential. Even if you do not have a boundary if you have a circle then the eigenvalues can get quantized for instance if you look at the eigenvalues of the z component of the angular momentum they must satisfy minus i h cross delta over delta phi times the wave function whatever it is. Uh, let us let us call the wave function f of phi equal to m h cross f of phi and then this wave function uh, f of phi if you require it to be single valued the possible values of m are discrete. So the angular momentum component L z has eigenvalues m h cross m equal to integer 
and that comes about by the single valuedness requirement or the periodic boundary condition requirement hmm? still on this space, yes pardon still the variable x is continuous variable. yes the variable x i mean this becomes replaced by an operator x becomes gets replaced by an operator so let me for the moment just to distinguish operators let me call it x operator and that acts on eigen states which are labeled by the eigen value itself and the eigen value we know is continuous so we have a uh, an equation of this kind this guy here is the ket vector corresponding to the particle having a precise position x some given x now because it is a continuous spectrum the normal equations you write down for a discrete spectrum have to be modified slightly for example orthonormality would be something like delta of x minus x prime rather than a Kronecker delta and completeness would be an integral over dx x x equal to the unit operator. Now as far as notation is concerned this looks like a trivial change from the Kronecker delta you have gone to this and from a summation over all possible eigenvalues eigenstates you have actually done an integration but it is more profound than that it uh, takes a little more work to discuss what a continuous basis is and I have slurred over those technical details and simply assume that you have a continuous basis labeled by these fellows here. But of course you could raise many objections to it like what is the value of the delta function when the uh, argument vanishes etc formally this becomes infinite and what is meant by this projector here etc etc but we have not got into those technical details okay. So we have not really spent much time on discussing the technical details of continuous spectra in this case. Now the energy itself the Hamiltonian itself if you look at a thing like the harmonic oscillator which is p squared plus uh, x squared over 2 in suitable units this has a continuous spectrum that has a continuous spectrum but the square of this plus the square of that over 2 has a discrete spectrum and this is possible this is entirely possible are these bounded operators in the sense that do they have a finite norm no because the eigenvalues can become as large as you please for each of these and therefore there are states in the system whose norms would become enormous and even if you normalize by dividing by the norm of the states it is clear that uh, <coughs> roughly speaking once the eigenvalues of an operator become unbounded the operator is un unbounded too. The spectrum of this operator which as you know is uh, half h cross omega 3 halves etc is bounded from below but not from above in uh, the total energy if it is not bounded from below you are in trouble because it means the ground state is at minus infinity and things would fall into the ground state it would take an infinite amount of energy to raise it from the ground state but this is exactly where quantum mechanics plays a role and helps you get a finite value and we are going to do that when I talk about the hydrogen atom because for the hydrogen atom the potential is a central potential and it is a 1 over r potential this goes like minus z e squared over r in suitable units. Now of course classically the ground state of the electron when it is orbiting round a positive charge would be inside the nucleus itself it would be at r equal to 0 because it will just fall down into the in this potential but quantum mechanically we know that the answer is some minus 1 over n squared and then keeps increasing so in Rydberg units at minus 13.6 electron volts what is it that does it what feature of quantum mechanics is responsible for raising the energy level from the classical minus infinity to minus 13.6 electron volts what do you think it is classically the equilibrium state would be the particles at zero momentum right at the origin what would that violate violates the uncertainty principle so you cannot have both therefore quantum mechanically the system compromises by saying you come too close to the origin the potential energy gets too low the kinetic energy gets too high and so on it compromises by saying there is a ground state here at this point and of course as the uh, energy increases you have more and more states 
and the fact that this potential goes to 0 very slowly like 1 over r is what is responsible for an infinite number of bound states. Had it cut off at some finite point then you would only have a finite number of bound states. For instance you look at the delta function potential the attractive delta function potential in one dimension you had just one bound state. You put two of them you could have a second bound state you take a finite well you will always have a ground state but you might have 1, 2, 3 more etc. But you extend the range of the potential to infinity then the possibility that you also have an infinite number of bound states arises and that is what happens in the case of the hydrogen atom. So if this potential goes to 0 sufficiently slowly at infinity then you can have an infinite number of bound states okay. and we will uh, write down the criterion for this as well. On the other hand if the potential goes to 0 too rapidly at the origin then there is what is called collapse to the origin and the strength of the potential is so large that even quantum mechanics cannot rescue you and you do not have any bound states things have just collapsed into the origin. Any potential that goes to 0 faster than 1 over r squared at the origin becomes singular and apart from special cases you do not have the conventional kind of bound states at all in such potentials. So going to 0 too fast at the origin is bad going to 0 too uh, slowly at infinity also can lead to an infinite number of bound states on the other side. So the Coulomb potential is poised very nicely in between it is 1 over r and it has an infinite number of bound states but the lowest bound, certainly the spectrum is bounded from below okay. okay there was another question on spin. Yeah, angular momentum algebra and uh, the total angular momentum algebra, algebra is clear and the prediction from that is also clear okay. but how the uh, as you said in the previous class the spin angular momentum is something which we, see, which we associate intrinsically to that yes. particle. Yes. So I doubt how that how that concept arises how you distinguish this from total angular momentum. How did the idea of spin arise yeah uh, this I should have mentioned since I did not give much about the history of spin how it arose this is perhaps a little mysterious still you see the spectra of uh, atoms as you know from various other courses the lines emitted by atoms the spectral lines correspond to transitions between the various energy states available for these for the electrons in these atoms. Now long ago when quantum mechanics was first formulated and the hydrogen atom spectrum for instance was being explained in quantum mechanics it turned out that there were discrepancies between the predictions of the normal Schrodinger equation the usual Schrodinger equation for these spectral lines and what was actually observed and various, uh, various uh, resolutions were proposed but the one that turned out to be the right the correct one had to do with the concept of an intrinsic angular momentum or spin and this was postulated by various people in particular by Ohlenbeck and Goudsmit they specifically said that there is such a thing called spin and it is a two valued variable and then the famous experiment of Stern and Gerlach established what this meant and the experiment goes as follows you recall that I mentioned that the intrinsic magnetic moment of the electron this guy here was equal to uh, some gyromagnetic ratio which is g times the charge of the electron over twice the mass of the electron multiplied by the spin of the electron the spin operator of the electron here and then of course we also said that g was equal to 2 and this was equal to minus modulus of e and this spin operator was h cross over 2 times the Pauli matrix and this was an operator which had eigenvalues plus or minus 1 along any direction. So this whole thing became equal to E h cross mod E h minus over 2 m E sigma and this was what was called the Bohr magneton. Okay. Now you could ask what is the consequence of this? and how do you measure this directly and what was done by Stern and Gerlach was to show that this has a real measurable effect 
once you place these electrons in a magnetic field. But of course placing free electrons in a magnetic field is quite a trick. So what they did was to take silver atoms, and silver has 47 electrons, 46 of them lie in a closed shell essentially contributing nothing to the magnetic moment. And this whole shell is essentially spherically symmetrical so you might assume that in a ground state these things are actually in a total angular momentum equal to 0 state. The 47th electron the 5s electron is also in an orbital angular momentum equal to 0 state but it has a spin. So this heavy particle now the full silver atom essentially acts like a single magnetic moment due to the electron itself due to the intrinsic magnetic moment of the electron or the spin of the electron. Now once you have a magnetic moment and you place it in a magnetic field then there is a mu dot p potential and if the magnetic field is inhomogeneous not homogeneous in space but inhomogeneous there is a force and the force is minus the gradient of this potential. So the idea they had was to prepare a beam of silver ions it is monochromatic and so on the sense that they is made it is collimated it is made mono energetic and so on and then by methods which we will not go into. So here is the path of that and then you put it in the path of a magnetic field whose pole pieces are like this. This is an inhomogeneous magnetic field you can see that there is a drastic change in the magnetic field it is not parallel lines of force at all but it is inhomogeneous changes as you go along any of the directions say the z direction and then what happens is if you look at only the z direction of this field the force is proportional to delta over delta z mu times bz where mu is the magnitude of this mu dot b is equal to mu delta bz over delta z. Therefore if along this direction the z component of the magnetic field changes substantially you would have due to this term here you would have differing forces depending on whether you had the plus eigenvalue or the minus eigenvalue. So in one case the force would be upwards in the other case the force would be downwards. Therefore the path of this guy would either go like that or like this and if you put a screen here and you measure the intensities here you would discover how many such states there are in fact you would find out if the spin is half or three halves or whatever you can find out what the spin is because there would be that many spots hmm, depending on what the allowed values of this mu are. Okay. So this is how it was established that indeed the spin of an electron is a half hmm. but we see from our general theory of angular momentum that the allowed eigenvalues of the angular momentum operator itself whatever be the eigen uh, origin of this angular momentum are in fact 0, half, 1, 3 halves and so on and so forth and then it was recognized that the spin was in fact one of the half integer valued representations. Now one could ask what are the deeper implications of the spin half where did it really come from why did this why did the angular momentum quantum number itself turn out to have either integer values or half integer values. We saw that it came out of the algebra of the angular momentum operators themselves but orbital angular momentum takes only integer values and I gave a sort of hand waving argument saying that that is because it is got to have single valued wave functions you could ask what about the spin wave function does it not have single valued uh, wave functions and so on what does it imply and where does it really come from this half come from I will spend a few minutes and tell you where the half integer comes from why you have double valued representations for the rotation group but this was the historical origin of spin yeah. Yes so you, it will be affected by the orbital angular momentum so if for example you are in L equal to 2 then the total angular momentum would have values in, in L minus half to L plus half and then you could have if it were 2 it could go from 3 halves to 5 halves or something like that and each of those would get split into 2j plus 1 values and you would have a large number of lines here. This is why they chose very cleverly an atom where it was guaranteed that the total angular momentum would be that due to the intrinsic angular momentum of the outermost electron of a single electron 
and that unambiguously established that it is spin half okay. But of course in more complicated atoms you have much more complicated spectra definitely. Now in the hydrogen atom itself notice that I mentioned there was thing called a spin orbit coupling where there was a coupling between the magnetic moment of the electron and the orbital motion of the electron. The magnetic moment which the electron sees as a result of the proton going around it if you like and forming a current loop and that leads to an effective Hamiltonian which is L dot s proportional to L dot s and that breaks the central force nature of the potential that the electron sees and then the degeneracy that you have of various uh, uh, the L levels being degenerate is completely removed. You can also remove the degeneracy of the Coulomb potential by applying a magnetic field. Magnetic field applied to any atom is going to have lead to a splitting of the different M levels and it is called the Zeeman effect etc. You could also break it by applying an electric field and then it is called the Stark effect. So these are spectroscopic effects which were early day in the early days of quantum mechanics established the reality of spin and so on in various ways. So the essential picture is correct as we see it. Yeah. Now for a few minutes on why uh, we have spin half and let me yeah. So we did the equivalence of Schrodinger and Heisenberg picture. Yes. Uh -huh. We saw that the Hamiltonian in both the representation is the same. Yes. This is because we tacitly assume that H is independent of time. Yes. Indeed. But what will happen if H is dependent on time? This is a very good question. The, que uh, the question is we found when we talked about the equivalence of pictures that H Schrodinger in the Schrodinger picture where just to recall to you what the two pictures are quickly. In the Schrodinger picture as opposed to the Heisenberg picture you had the Schrodinger equation i h cross d over d t psi of t equal to h psi of t and let me now distinguish between the pictures by writing h Schrodinger here. Then the state vector was time dependent physical operators were assumed to be time independent including the Hamiltonian no explicit time dependence. So we look at all those operators which do not have explicit time dependence. Then the state vector evolves in time psi of t is e to the minus i h t over h cross psi of 0 and the expectation value of any operator a at time t is given by psi of t a psi of t and this is in the Schrodinger picture. The time dependence for physical quantities measured quantities comes about because the state vector changes with time. Now one can make a unitary transformation on this picture and arrive at the Heisenberg picture where the time uh, the, op, the the wave functions the, the state vectors are supposed to be time independent. So let me put psi s everywhere just to make it clear. This in the Heisenberg picture could be taken to be the Schrodinger wave function or uh, state vector at some particular instant of time fiducial instant of time which I will choose to be 0 does not have to be but some origin of time. Then the physical operators are supposed to obey the equation of motion A Heisenberg and now I let me put in explicit time dependence here. The operator is supposed to be a time dependent operator. This is equal to AH of T H Heisenberg in principle of t in principle this will also depend on time in principle this does not change at all. What is true in both cases is that if you solve this equation if you solve this thing here this says a h of t is e to the power i h t over h cross h Heisenberg t etcetera etcetera. 
e h of 0 e to the minus i Heisenberg plus i uh, minus where h cross. The way you match these two pictures is by saying that I want for physical quantities I want exactly the same answer on both sides. So I require that this guy also be equal to the expectation value of a h of t which is the same as phi a h of t phi. I require these two to be exactly the same that implies all these other things working backwards. Now the question is if the Hamiltonian so it turns out the according to the prescription that you have here the solution here if you look at h itself on both sides since h commutes with itself these two factors come right across when I substitute for a h and I get h of h Heisenberg of t is the same as h Heisenberg of 0 which by definition is h Schrodinger. This is what I get provided h Schrodinger did not involve time. But of course there are problems where the Hamiltonian itself involves time for instance if I am pumping energy into a system then the Hamiltonian is explicitly time dependent it is not an autonomous system. What happens then well the Schrodinger equation continues to be true this continues to be true that is the Schrodinger equation the input and now the solution to this is not so trivial psi s of t is equal to not an exponential but a more complicated operator some u of t which acts on psi s of 0 and this has got the form of what is called a time ordered exponential hmm. it is a more complicated operator and if time permits in this course I will derive this expression here it is not too difficult to derive an expression for this this is a unitary operator which is not e to the i h t nor is it the very simple e to the minus i h over h cross integral 0 to t dt prime h s of t prime. This is what one would expect if these naively because if this were not an operator this is just a function here this is certainly would be true and in the case when it becomes time independent you just get h s and then t out here which was the original solution. But this is not true because there is no guarantee that h s of t prime commutes with h s of any other time and since e to the a e to the b is not e to the a plus b you cannot write it in this fashion here instead you write it in what is called a time ordered exponential denoted in this fashion which is formally like an exponential but it involves certain time ordering inside here in any case the solution is some unitary transformation acting on this then you can go to the Heisenberg picture by making a unitary transformation using not so you could go to the Heisenberg picture from the Schrodinger picture for any other operator using the fact that the two would coincide with each other at some specific instant of time like 0. So that is always permitted. I can take an exponential here and an exponential here use for it the operator at some instant of time h s of 0 for instance that will give you the unitary transformation from one picture to the other. So you can still go to the so called Heisenberg picture nothing is going to uh, be different except in technical detail but it would not be the original very simple exponential that you wrote down but this is just a matter of convention here that the two pictures coincide at t equal to 0 that is it that is all I need. But now if you ask what does the evolution itself look like then you have a slightly different viewpoint here in such cases notice 
that the Hamiltonian continues to generate time translations always because that is what the content of this uh, Schrodinger equation is. But if this for example had explicit time dependence then there is an extra term here which has got a partial derivative term and so on. So this is a simple exercise to work out what is the move to what is the shift or transformation to the Heisenberg picture when you have explicitly time dependent a time dependent Hamiltonian it is not too difficult even this is not, not difficult write down let me write this down this is equal to the unit operator minus i over h cross the first term is 0 to t let me just call it dt1 hs of t1 the second term would be plus minus i over h cross whole squared 1 over 2 factorial if you did not have any problems with time ordering this would be integral 0 to t dt1 integral 0 to t dt2 hs of t1 hs of t2 plus higher orders the square of this integral is what I have written in that form. But because you have this problem with time ordering this thing here becomes this 2 factorial goes away and this becomes 0 to t1. So the later time appears on the right the earlier times appear on the left in this fashion and that neatly cancels the 1 over 2 factorial here because this quantity here if they were classical commuting variables is a symmetric function of t1 and t2 and what you are doing is in the t1 t2 space you are integrating over this square but the integrand is symmetric and therefore the integral over this triangle is equal to the integral over this triangle. So you can get the rate of the factor 2 and write it in this fashion here okay and you have taken care of time ordering earlier times to the left later times to the right. In the next term the cubic term you would have a 1 over 3 factorial and then a triple integral but you see that integral would be over it would be I am very bad at drawing squares. if you take one axis going in one axis in this fashion it would be over this cube t1 t2 t3 each of side t etc. There are now six ways in which you can order t1 t2 and t3 and there is exactly one way in which you have t1 greater than t2 greater than t3. So the 3 factorial cancels in the denominator and gives you an integral 0 to t dt1, 0 to t1 dt2, 0 to t2 dt3, h of t1, h of t2, h of t3 and so on and it exactly cancels. So each time you have this hypercube and the 1 over n factorial goes and you have an ordered uh, prescription and that is what is meant by this time ordered exponential and that turns out to be the right solution for this operator here for this unitary evolution here. So this is not a, a, a difficult problem at all Ta explicitly time dependent Hamiltonians although you must remember that explicitly time dependent Hamiltonian means you do not have stationary states any longer not very useful. All right. Now a couple of statements since I would like to do the radial force problem but let me start on that tomorrow a couple, uh, let me spend the rest of today telling you why you, to give some feel for why this uh, spin half arose where did this come from really. I might have mentioned this earlier did I talk about the parameter space of the rotation group in three dimensions at some stage 
Well, let me do this quickly, and let me also bring out the connection between. Uh -huh. SO3 and SU2. This is important, so let me let me do that. Okay. Uh, and goes as follows. You know that uh, in three-dimensional space, I would like to generate rotations. And what's my definition of a rotation? It's a linear transformation of the coordinates, which leaves a point unchanged. The origin, in this case, unchanged. It's linear and homogeneous. That means the origin is mapped to the origin and everything else changes and it has determinant plus 1. This implies that the handedness of the coordinate system is not changed. The right handed coordinate system remains a right handed coordinate system. Those three suffice to fix rotations and they form a group. This group is called SO3. S stands for determinant plus 1 special or determinant plus 1. O stands for orthogonal because the transformations have to be orthogonal in order to ensure that the distance between any two points is not changed under the rotation and it is in three dimensions so it is called SO3. Okay. The set of matrices 3 by 3 matrices if you like which are orthogonal which have determinant plus 1 they form a group. The unit matrix is the identity element and these matrices form a representation of the abstract group of rotations. So the rotations are operations and they are abstract but they are explicitly represented by the set of orthogonal matrices 3 by 3 orthogonal matrices with determinant plus 1. Okay. Now the next question is what is the parameter space of this set of rotations. In other words, what are the values of the angles that specify the possible rotations? Now these can be specified in many ways. As you know, you can go to one coordinate system to a rotated one by specifying three Euler angles. But you can specify those Euler angles in many different ways. They all turn out to be equivalent to each other, but it is nothing unique about it. The most convenient way of specifying these rotations is to say that the rotation occurs about some axis in space with respect to some fixed coordinate system through a certain amount of rotation through a certain angle. So to specify the direction in space I need a unit vector and to specify the amount of rotation I need one more angle which can take on values from 0 to 2 pi. So the rotation is specified by a unit vector and an angle which takes values from 0 to 2 pi and let me call that my angle psi. I do not want to confuse with theta and phi which I will use for polar coordinates for n here. So is this clear that I fix my fix a coordinate system to start with first in the lab and then I say I am going to make a rotation about this unit vector and of course there is a perpendicular plane to this unit vector and I am going to rotate once I draw a reference line on that I am going to rotate about a certain angle from 0 to 2 pi. So the parameters I need to specify the rotation are n and psi. n is a unit vector so it is specified by two polar angles in Cartesian coordinates these would be sin theta cos phi sin theta, sin phi and cos phi. There are two independent variables here because the three components of n the squares add up to unity. Okay. The physical range of theta is 0 less than equal to theta less than equal to pi that goes from the north pole to the south pole and the physical range of phi is 0 less than equal to phi less than 2 pi that is the azimuthal angle in the x y plane and theta is a polar angle. Okay. Now what are the surfaces by the way in plane in spherical polar coordinates what are the surfaces x equal to constant y equal to constant z equal to constant what what sort of objects are these surfaces what sort of surfaces planes of course 
what about r equal to constant spheres what about uh, theta equal to constant half cones they are really cones theta equal to constant if the cone is at an acute angle then theta is less than pi over 2 if it is got an obtuse angle then theta is between pi and pi over 2 pi over 2 and pi hmm? what about phi equal to constant half planes really half planes because they pass through the origin and you are distinguishing between phi and phi plus pi so really it is half planes okay what is the range of variation of psi obviously 0 less than equal to psi less than equal to 2 pi less than 2 pi that is the amount of rotation you can do in the psi direction. So now we have three variables with specified ranges and we can pretend that we can put them as points in a certain space and we can model that space in three dimensional space we have three variables three dimensional space available and the way it is done is to say I will use a sphere as my model and the direction from the origin on this sphere to any point on inside or on the sphere is going to be the specification of the unit vector n. So if I say this n then the polar angle of this n and the azimuthal angle of this n correspond to the theta and phi here of the rotation that I have in mind and since I must have a rotation going from 0 to 2 pi I could take the solid sphere to have a radius 2 pi and then say that by convention by definition the distance from the origin to the point I am interested in specifies psi. So you see I modeled the three dimensional three angles I have modeled in a solid sphere of radius 2 pi right but I would like to make very sure that every point in this space corresponds to uh, one rotation and only one rotation I do not want any double counting and I do not want to leave out any rotations either okay. but in three dimensions it is a fact of life that if I rotate an object through pi about an axis it is the same as rotating it about pi through the opposite axis that is a fact of three dimensional life so let us take this object I always give this demonstration and let us put a little mark here with an arrow here upwards and now I start in this position and I rotate about this axis through pi and the arrows were pointing upwards in this direction and I can see it on this side I start here in the same original position and I rotate about that axis again through pi but the axis is pointing that way so you have to look down from above and again it points in exactly the same direction so this means rotating about a certain axis through pi is the same as rotating about minus that axis through pi once again a little less this is no longer true if I rotate if I start again and rotate through pi about this axis a little less than pi I am at this point but if I do the same thing through the opposite axis I am at that point and these two are not the same final orientations only when I hit pi is this coincidence going to happen so this means that this space need not have a radius equal to 2 pi pi is enough because if this is pi that is sufficient because I also have the possibility of rotating about the diametrically opposite direction the antipodal direction here. but there is a further complication and the complication is that this point is mathematically the same as that point in this parameter space because they both correspond to rotation by pi about an axis or its opposite and they physically correspond to the same rotation so the parameter space of SO3 is complicated it is a solid sphere its radius is pi but it has also got the property that you must mathematically identify every point on its surface with its antipodal point 
it is as if there is an invisible connection between opposite points and of course such a space cannot be represented in 3 Euclidean dimensions. So this is the space all right it is a respectable space but you cannot re represent it in 3 Euclidean dimensions okay. but you can look at all its mathematical properties given this property. Okay. Now this space is connected the connected space is one where you can go from any point in the space to any other point in the space continuously without leaving the space. Okay. So this space is certainly connected there is no doubt about it but it is not simply connected a simply connected space is one where any path any continuous closed path in the space can be continuously deformed or shrunk to a point without leaving the space. Hmm. For instance if I took the plane of this blackboard any point to any other point I can go by an arc wise path every closed path of this kind can be shrunk continuously to a point without leaving this blackboard. So that space is certainly connected and simply connected a space which connects which has for example one piece here and another piece here and this part does not belong to the space is not connected because there is a path here point here and a point here and you cannot join them continuously by an arc wise path which does not leave the space on the other hand this space if that is your space with a hole punched out in it is connected because you can go from any point to any point continuously without leaving the space but it is not simply connected because although you can close a closed path like this and shrink it down to a point a closed path like this cannot be shrunk to a point because there is no way you are going to be able to cross that hole and this path will get stuck at the periphery of this hole. So here is a space which is connected but not simply connected in fact even if you exclude one point that is good enough for the purpose of uh, avoiding connective uh, simple connectivity even one point is punctured is removed from the space then the space is not simply connected. So a sheet with a hole punctured punch in it even a single point is not a simply connected space then the next question is if it is not simply connected what kind of connectivity does it have and this is precisely answerable one says paths are equivalent to each other if you can deform one to the other continuously. So in that sense this path is completely equivalent to this path it is completely equivalent to this path etc they can all like rubber bands be deformed to each other but this path here cannot be deformed to this path because that path cannot be shrunk to a point whereas this can be shrunk to a point. So what one asks for is what are the classes of paths which can all be deformed to each other all paths which can be deformed to each other form what is called an equivalence class they are all equivalent to each other then the question arises what are the different equivalence classes of paths that you have in a space it turns out that by an obvious rule of composition of paths of joining of paths these equivalence classes form the elements of a group so mind you we started with paths we started with closed paths and we said closed paths can all be put in different equivalence classes and these equivalence classes form elements of a group and the group composition law is just the composition of paths. So for instance if you had a path like this I start here I start, I start at this point I go down here I go here I come here and I go here then this path is composed of two paths one of which is just this guy and the other is this guy here and together they form the element of a group they form a third path in the group so equivalence classes of paths form the elements of a group 
and this group is called the fundamental group of the space it is called the fundamental homotopy group of the space. So if the space is V then it is called pi 1 of V and it is called the fundamental And this group as a group may have interesting properties. For instance, taking a simpler example, suppose the space is just S1, the rim of a cycle wheel, that is my space. I have to live on that space, so all parts are on that space. Then what are the equivalence classes of parts? It is clear wherever I start. I move about like this and then the only thing I can do is to go back to form a closed path. Now all such paths can be shrunk to a point continuously. So I could even come here and go around here and then go back that would still be shrunk to a point but the moment I complete the path by coming back to this point then I have actually taken a rubber band or rubber tube and covered the rim and there is no possibility without cutting this band of shrinking that band to a 0 anymore a point and I can then do it twice or thrice and you can see none of these can be shrunk to each other or I could have done it in the opposite sense because closed parts you must always specify a sense or direction and you can easily see intuitively that the number of inequivalent ways in which you can take a rubber band and cover the cycle wheel is just the set of integers is in one to one correspondence with the set of integers. If you wind if the path winds around once in the positive direction call it winding number 1, if it winds around twice call it winding number 2, minus 1, minus 2 and so on. So in this case it is easy to see that pi 1 of S1 is in fact the set of integers. The set of integers under addition because when you compose paths all you are doing is adding winding numbers all the time. Clearly if you go around three times in the positive sense and twice in the negative sense you have gone around once in the positive sense. So it is the group of integers under addition and it has profound implications. What is pi 1 of S2? Now we have the surface of a sphere in three dimensions and I put a closed path on it a rubber band what is pi 1 of S2 all parts can be shrunk to a point on it without leaving the space and this is graphically stated as by saying you cannot lasso a basketball because things will slip off and therefore pi 1 of S2 is in fact got just one element the trivial group so there are many ways of writing it people write it like this or they say there is just the identity element I like to just write it or just 0 just write it as 0 that means a trivial group we have to be little careful with notation this equal to 0 a group equal to 0 means that it has only one element monarch of all is a base there is no other element in there okay similarly pi 1 of s3 is 0 pi 1 of sn and dimensions also intuitively clear it is just 0. Now coming to our space we ask what is pi 1 but before that this is the T to, uh, this is T2 it is the 2 torus it is the 2 torus and that is formed by taking a circle direct product circle for every point on it in this direction you associate a circle in the other direction too and you get S1 cross S2 which is T2 the 2 torus the surface it is a 2 dimensional object. Now what are the possible closed parts on this what is this going to be what is pi 1 of this going to be it is just going to be Z cross Z because any closed path on it can be converted to going around this larger radius a certain number of times and winding around this other guy a certain number of times 
So, pi 1 of k 2 is in fact z cross z. That is obvious the moment you have this direct product then it is just pi 1 of this cross product with the pi 1 of the other direct product of pi 1 of the other. Okay. So, close paths on the torus two torus can be specified by two winding numbers. The group we are concerned with for the rotation group is somewhat different. Now we have to discover what are all the possible close paths when you have the origin here such that these points are connected to that. Well it is quite clear that if you took any path like this anything inside or anything lying on the surface going back etc those would all and coming back to the same point they would all be shrunk to a point. So there is one class of closed paths which is just the conventional class of closed paths. But there is a second class of closed paths which corresponds to starting here going to the surface but then that point is the same as this and therefore this. This is a closed path in that space although it is hard for you to imagine that this is so it is a closed path in that space and it is completely distinct from the other class of closed parts which can be shrunk to a point because this cannot be shrunk to a point. If you try doing it and you try moving then this fellow moves perversely if you want to bring this closer to this guy and you start moving this goes in the other direction. So this is not the way to close this path. On the other hand the trick is you start here and you go out you ended up here and you come back do it again right on top of the old path I am just showing it separately for convenience and you are here and you come there. This can be shrunk to a point because this path is entirely equivalent to doing this little trick. And of course if you move this guy then this fellow is going to move there so after some time I have done this but that fellow has moved here and this guy has moved there. And then I move this point here this point moves that is very good and so does the guy does this. and then both are gone. So it is clear that by doing this close path a second time I have actually been able to come back to the original no rotation at all equivalent to no rotation at all. But what does that imply that is a rotation of 4 pi instead of a rotation of 2 pi which is a complete rotation I do a rotation of 4 pi and this object comes back to itself. So this means there exists in this parameter space two classes of objects those that come back to themselves after a rotation of 2 pi and those that come back to themselves after a rotation of 4 pi. This is the origin of the half integer valued uh, quantum representations of the rotation group. So j equal to 0, 1, 2 etc these would be called the tensor representations and j equal to half 3 halves etc are called the spinner So you know that in the normal tensor representations a tensor of rank 0 is a scalar and then you have a vector and then you have a tensor of rank 2 and so on. The spinners so to speak interpolate between these. So you do not have the normal properties that you have for vectors tensors etc namely when you change these everything by when you rotate everything by 2 pi the coordinate system they come back to themselves here there is a change of sign and the second rotation brings you back 
to the original value always and it turns out these are the only two things possible. In fact the way you would write this is to say that in that you would specify this is to say that SO3 is doubly connected pi 1 of SO3 is Z2 set of integers modulo 2 okay, just two elements in the group okay. then you could ask is there a way of changing from pi 1 to some other group which is single valued such that there is a mapping from that group to this and the answer is yes and that is very very important for quantum mechanics I have run out of time so let me do that tomorrow unless we want to continue after some time do you like to take a break and continue so I finish this. Okay. Thank you.